The history of the Bowie knife is shrouded in mystery and speculation. But what we do know is that the Bowie knife evolved in appearance from the time of Jim Bowie's famous sandbar fight to what we consider to be a Bowie knife today. Jim Bowie is an American legend and the Bowie knife is America's knife. It embodies the desire to tame the wild frontier and to carry a trusted companion for self-defense from scoundrels with ill intent. The Bowie knife has proven itself in combat from the Texas Revolution to today. And bears, cougars, and wild hogs have also been slain with this knife by outdoorsmen in life and death situations out in the wild. In this video, I'll discuss the history and modern relevance of the Bowie knife. Jim Bowie was a famous American pioneer, explorer, warrior, and knife fighter. Early in Jim Bowie's life, he was tangled up in illegal activities such as slave smuggling and land scams. In fact, these scams and illegal activity made him quite wealthy. In 1827, on a sandbar in the Mississippi River, Jim Bowie and his knife became famous. While attending a duel, a melee broke out between rival parties, which quickly devolved into a gun and knife fight. Bowie was shot twice, impaled in the chest by a cane sword, and stabbed multiple times with knives. But he fought through the wounds and emerged victorious after killing his rival with his knife. There were more unsubstantiated knife fights that Bowie reportedly won. In 1831, Bowie fought off an Indian raid through 13 straight hours of sustained combat, which included a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat, which further enhanced his reputation as a fighter. Bowie joined the Texas militia and ultimately died in the famous Battle of the Alamo. Stories of Bowie's courage and fighting prowess spread quickly across the country, and Jim Bowie became an instant legend and folk hero. The knife that Jim Bowie carried at the sandbar fight was a gift from Jim's brother, Reason, who claims that he designed the original knife, which was reportedly made from a steel file by a blacksmith named Jesse Clift. Witnesses at the sandbar fight described that knife as a butcher knife with no handguards, no clip point, and simple wood scales that were riveted on. The knife used by Jim Bowie at the sandbar fight was probably something as simple as this. And <laughs> in real This is a... Uh, butcher knife from about the 1850s so this is kind of period correct right here and from the founding of this country well into the 20th century this is what an american butcher knife looked like <laughs> you know and as evidence that the sandbar buoy knife looked something like this another knife that reason bowie owned was presented to Jesse Perkins in 1831, and it has the identical shape to a period correct butcher knife, and also the Edwin Forrest knife, which is said to be a gift from Jim Bowie himself, also shares that same butcher knife profile. Of course, the knives that Jim Bowie carried after the sandbar fight were likely different than your classic butcher knife shape or profile. And it's logical to conclude that Bowie's own personal specifications for a fighting knife probably evolved over time. In 1830, a skilled knife maker in Arkansas named James Black claimed to have made the next knife that Jim Bowie carried. The most famous James Black creation is the knife that's engraved Bowie number one. 
Bowie frequented the town where Black Shop was, so it is conceivable that Bowie could have purchased a knife from James Black, especially since James Black's knives were of exceptionally high quality for the day, and Bowie would have been attracted to such a fine knife. The James Black Bowie knife has an elegant coffin handle, no handguard, and a blade shape that's reminiscent of what many would call an Arkansas toothpick. Black was said to have used some special steel and a special heat treat process that made his knives superior to anything else at the time. So it's entirely possible that Jim Bowie did own a James Black knife. And lastly, we have the claim by George Wollstoneholm that Jim Bowie was carrying a Wollstoneholm knife when he died at the Alamo. George Wollstoneholm uh, inherited his family owned a knife company in Sheffield, England, which was the, uh, the knife making hub of, uh, of England and the home of uh, most of the operations of their knife making guild. And Wollstoneholm traveled extensively to America in the 1830s to heavily market his knives here. And the legend of Jim Bowie just captivated Europeans and the knife makers of Sheffield were quick to capitalize on that. Sheffield knives, called Bowie knives, flooded the American market in the 1830s all the way up past the American Civil War. And most Bowie knives in America were actually Sheffield knives. The Sheffield Bowie knives had a clip point blade on them, usually with a false edge that might be sharpened. And this is actually a real period correct Sheffield knife right here. And this false edge is indeed sharpened on this example. And uh, these Sheffield knives also had that uh, characteristic cross guard on it for hand protection. So the modern interpretation of what a Bowie knife looks like was probably a British creation rather than an American one. But later on, as the Civil War raged on, Bowie knives uh, became a lot fatter and heavier. And the Confederate Bowie knife usually had a D-shaped full handguard, and some of them had huge foot-long blades on them. And the fighting often went from musket to bayonet to Bowie knife during that bloody war. In the golden age of the Bowie knife, from the late 1820s to the end of the Civil War, the Bowie knife was primarily an implement of self-defense or close quarters combat. Firearms in Jim Bowie's time were single shot flintlock guns that were highly unreliable. Firearms were also banned from many saloons and establishments. This made a knife the primary weapon of the day for most altercations. Also, many formal duels were also fought with knives instead of pistols. Everyone carried a knife in those days. It wasn't uncommon for politicians in state assemblies to get into knife fights during legislative sessions. In 1837, the Arkansas Speaker of the House killed another state congressman on the floor of the House with a Bowie knife. The Mississippi Delta was just chocked full of master swordsmen and fencing schools in those days, particularly with influence from uh, Spain and France. And soon training was developed that adapted these blade arts to using a Bowie knife. So there were many skilled knife fighters around in that day and age. Although the Bowie knife was used to butcher game animals and fend off wildlife, its primary purpose was for use against other people. It gained such a gruesome reputation as a weapon that states like Alabama, Tennessee, Virginia, Texas, and Mississippi tried to ban or restrict its use. The Bowie knife 
was the assault weapon of the 1830s. Eventually, the six-shot revolver became mainstream, and the Bowie knife was no longer a primary item of self-defense any longer. Also, as cities grew, so did law and order, and most people saw no need to carry a big knife anymore. But the Civil War brought the Bowie knife back to prominence again. Both sides used Bowie knives, but the Confederate soldiers used them probably more extensively. Many major battles in the Civil War ended in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and the Bowie knife was just a welcome companion in those circumstances. The last hurrah for the Bowie knife was probably during the Wild West era. You know, in, in the civilized eastern United States, the Bowie knife was basically a thing of the past, but out west, gold prospectors, market hunters, cowboys, and outlaws all carried a sizable Bowie knife. As we entered into the 20th century, the days of the pioneer, frontiersmen, and Wild West were pretty much over, and firearms and smokeless gunpowder made huge advancements. Pretty much a large Bowie knife was no longer a practical thing to carry or use. During that time, the Bowie knife was scaled down again into a hunting knife, and at this, it really excelled. In fact, manufacturers eventually stopped calling a clip point knife a Bowie knife anymore, and they were simply known as hunting knives from that point on. But by the time World War II happened, the U.S. Marines decided to get serious about knives. You know, in the past, they used daggers and trench knives, you know, in addition to the big Collins number 18 survival knife. But the Marines wanted a fast and handy knife that could also be used as a utility knife. And that was the birth of the M2 combat knife. My grandfather ran up several beaches in the Pacific carrying his trusty K-Bar, and a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat took place in those hell holes with these K-Bars. Only one large Bowie knife was an American fixture well into the 20th century, and that was the venerable Western W49 Bowie knife. The W49 is a high-quality American-made Bowie that had the stereotypical look of an Old West Bowie. You know, this classic escarred shape right here um, almost looks like the, uh, the giant statue that they have erected in, uh, in Bowie, Texas. In fact, the look of this knife was so popular, in the 1972 movie Jeremiah Johnson, Robert Redford carried this exact knife. The Western W-49 was also used extensively by American soldiers in Vietnam. And uh, the W-49 is just a great knife. Um, another one people kind of carried a little bit um, going further was uh, the Ontario uh, Marine Raider, which is a copy of the old uh, Raider knife from uh, the turn of the, back at the turn of the century. But the reality was that People were buying knives like this Western W49 or a, a Case XX buoy for only nostalgia reasons. The big buoys weren't popular as work or self-defense knives and really didn't have a practical purpose in the modern world. Smaller knives were just more useful, practical, and concealable. Eventually, Scaled-down versions of the Bowie knife became most popular, and we began calling them hunting knives or camp knives or combat knives instead of Bowies. But the big old giant Bowie knife wasn't dead yet. There was a resurgence in interest in big Bowie knives in 1982 when the Rambo movies came out, and instantly the big Bowie knife was back in fashion. Then, Crocodile Dundee 
showed us what a real knife looks like. And not to be outdone, Arnold Schwarzenegger had to show off his Bowie knives as well. Eventually, the Hollywood hype kind of wore off though, and people learned that a big heavy Bowie knife just wasn't as useful or practical as they thought. And as we closed out the 1990s, almost all fighting, survival, and bushcraft knives ditched the clip point and the cross guard. So in the year 2024, the large Bowie knife in its stereotypical form has been relegated to being mostly a collector's item. In the era of drop points, scandy grinds, and super steels, the traditional Bowie knife has been mostly cast aside, but there are some of us who open up a buck 110 or use an old buck 119 hunting knife who still appreciate the utility of the classic designs. So what is a Bowie knife? If I hold up a knife like this, like the one that the witnesses of the sandbar fight described, most people will say, that's not a Bowie knife at all. But if I hold a knife like this up, everybody will automatically say, man, that's a nice Bowie knife. Even though this design most likely developed after Jim Bowie was dead, and it probably originated in Sheffield, England. <laughs> My first sentence in the opening of this video was that the history of the Bowie knife is shrouded in mystery and speculation. And that's also how I'll, I'll conclude this video. Jim Bowie never left us direct evidence of what his last knife looked like uh, when he died. You know, add to this the fact that the basic design elements of all Bowie knives existed before Jim Bowie was even born. So I ask again, what is a Bowie knife? Because I honestly don't know.